How's everyone doing today? Doing good? God is good. I am glad to be here. How many are excited to hear the Word of God? Yeah. Amen. Let's get, well, that's, I tell you, hey, it used to be the second service was excited, and this service was the mellow one. Now you guys are the radical ones, and the second service is like, so don't, don't be like them, okay? Be excited, because uh, we're, we're, we're getting people to pray for the second service. It's like it's totally flipped. It's weird. It's like, uh, it's um, totally different. So I want to keep that encouragement. We're going to see today that it's important to have that first love. Your Bibles, please turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1. And does anyone need a Bible? If you need a Bible, raise your hand and we'll loan you a Bible. Does anyone need one? Everyone's got a Bible? Good. All right. I like that. That's right there. That's a face I like right there. That's good. The title of today's message is, The Lord is Pleading with You. The Lord is, you could say, pleading with us. In the first chapter, we saw the impressive call and commission of Jeremiah. God called him when he was just a young man, probably about 17 to 20 years old. We also saw, are going to see, that the King Josiah was the king at that time, and he was about 21 to 22 years old. Can you imagine being a king at that age? And so you have this prophet that's about 17 to 20. You have a king that's about 21 to 22 years old. And when God called Jeremiah, so the two of them, this young prophet and this young king, are um, governing or kind of leading the children of Israel. And so you see that's pretty amazing. How about, how's that for don't despise your youth? I mean, a 17-year-old and a 21-year-old running the country of, God, of Israel. It's pretty neat. Well, I, I was studying kind of ahead of the book and in chapters 10 and 12, I thought that was interesting. I just kind of want to share. This is like a little uh, preview. But in chapters 12, 10 through 12, the message comes. and They find the book of the law. And they find the word of God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the church getting so cold that they've lost the Bible? They've lost the Pentateuch. They've lost the first five books of the Bible. How many know we could say that today in churches? How many know that? There's a lot of churches that, uh, I'll be nice, I was going to say something that you might know of who it is, but there's people that like wave their Bible and say, this is my Bible, but they don't ever turn to the Bible. You know, I'll never forget, um, Greg Laurie went to a church, Greg Laurie is a Calvary guy, he went to a church and he uh, said to the people, he said, turn your Bibles to such and such a verse and nobody, he didn't hear any pages turning. And he said to them, it's all right to bring your Bible to church. And he got rebuked by the pastor. And if I said the pastor's name, you would, you would know his name. And how many know, it's, that's a weird thing. I never forget when I was a missionary at a Lutheran church, a liberal Lutheran church down the road. And I never forget the pastor said to me, he says, if you're the type of person that brings your Bible to church, you will not last here very long. How many know, we need to learn from the past. And we need to learn that they forgot the book of the law, but then when they got the book of the law, hear this, this is interesting to me, they had a somewhat of a reform, they had a revival, but it was only outward, and it was only temporary. How many know that can be us? It can be us because we sometimes get excited about the word, and we go, we go yeah, yeah, we want revival. But then, like I've said, we say, well, hey, let's do these things to have revival, and then we go, No. We need to be to the place where we say, God, I'll do whatever you want. And, and hear this. This is what I learned. If you're going to have a true revival, we have got to place a high emphasis upon the Word of God. That means, hear this, it doesn't mean just hearing the Word. It doesn't just mean gathering more information so you can win at Bible trivia. It means that you really know the Word. So that why? You and I can what? Live the Word. Apply it. That's the key. The key is that we apply the knowledge we know. As I said, you know, I've told you a hundred times, but I can't stop saying it, of that I've been invited to go to China and speak and teach. And they said that I would have to speak simply. And I think, how simple can you get? But they said they're very simple. But yet these Chinese Christians could put our faith and our devotion to God to shame. Amen. And the reason why is because what? What little they know, they live. 
Amen? Think about what you and I would be like if we lived what we knew. And, and that's the revival. Think about it right there. If you and I lived what we know, would that not be awakening? Would that not be revival? If we just said, that's it, I'm going to live it. I'm going to live it. And that's what happened. They got excited. They found the law, but yet then they didn't live by the law. They didn't continue in it, and that's the key. So in this chapter, chapter 2, we're going to see God's grace, his compassion, hear this, towards a guilty nation of Israel, a, a nation that has forsaken God. And this is probably one of the most interesting chapters because it's almost like God, I better be careful I say this, but it's almost like God is like desperate. I, I think of the song, if you want to have a theme song for this, it's almost like God is singing to the Israelites, you've lost that love and feeling, whoa. I mean, seriously, I was listening to that song today and I, you know, I thought of Top Gun, I get that out of your head, but I, but Think about that. God is saying, as we'll see, see if it's not true by the end of this message, that God is saying, Israel, my bride, you've lost your love and feeling for me. You've lost that first love for me. And you hear God wooing them, saying, come back to me. What have I done? And we need to hear that today because how many know that sometimes we think God will never deal with our sin? We almost believe the lie that as Americans, we can never be judged. How many know that is not true? Amen? We can be judged. We can be a great country, past tense. And if you look at it, we are starting to become a past tense great country. We're seeing the, the, all the strength we had is starting to slowly fade away. And how many know, I, I was talking to John, some of the elders, that just in the last 10 years, What's happened in our country has been amazing in a bad way. Can you imagine 10 more years of no change of God? Now, you say, well, Craig, see, this is why I don't like you right here, you know? <laughs> but why do I say this? So that what? Why is God wooing them? So we can what? Change. Yeah. Amen? You know, I get mad at me. I get mad at my wife when she says, honey, we need to watch what we eat. <laughs> because why? I don't really believe in change. I don't really, I'm like, yeah, it's bad, but it's not bad enough. And I'm like going, when is it going to be bad enough? Today I was trying to put on some jeans. My wife, if she's not here, she's not here. But I had black jeans. I couldn't button them. How many know I went, okay, I think it's getting to be enough. These jeans used to fit, and either she really washed them hot or something's wrong with me. You know, so you go, it's you. Okay, but, you know, and I think we need to say something's wrong with us. And that we need to say enough. You know, what are we going to do? We're coming to the new year in a couple weeks, three, four weeks. What are we going to do? We're all going to make pledges to what? Eat better, lose weight, and we'll do it for what? A month, maybe a month and a half, and then what happens? We usually go back. I'm praying that we can really leave this planet in rapture or death, that we fought the good fight and we finished the race. Amen? That we went for God. Amen. Not, oh yeah, I did for a month, and then I went back. That we really said enough is enough, and we really want the God who made this country great to be Lord of this country again. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray, God, right now I ask that you would direct my mind, direct my tongue, that I would say nothing more than you want me to say, but I most definitely wouldn't shrink back from saying all that you want me to say. Lord, give me a Holy Ghost boldness, but let me speak the truth always with love, always with your heart. I don't want to misrepresent you, Lord, but I don't want to also sell you as the softer side of seers, that you are not a God of justice, that you are not a God of severity, because there is a balance of you. You are a God of love, but you are also a God of justice. And you are a God of judgment. And I pray that we'll understand that balance. I pray that we'll thank you for your mercies and your loving kindness that endures forever, but that we will not take advantage of that. We will not think that, that, that that's a doormat for us to continue to sin, to continue to willfully disobey. Lord, let your loving kindness, your word says it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Lord, may your kindness just, just sweep us right now, just overwhelm us with your kindness 
your loving kindness. And may it not make us say, oh, I can get away with stuff. May it make us say, you know what, God, I'm tired. I'm tired of abusing grace. I'm tired of taking you for granted. I'm tired of not living for you. Today, I want to commit my life to you. Lord, I believe that the greatest commitment we can make is not for our bodies. Paul, you said through Paul that spiritual bodily discipline is of little value. This body is wasting away. But spiritual discipline, being healthy spiritually, has value, you said, for this life and the life to come. Lord, let us make sure that we're just as healthy spiritually as we are physically. First, it should be healthy spiritually because what does it mean to, to, to go to hell with a great corpse, a great body? Lord, we want to make sure that we're with you first and then work on our physical bodies. But let us have our right priorities, Lord. Let us be healthy spiritually. Let us be right with you. Let us love you. Let us have a heart that says, God, I don't just want to know about you, know what I should be doing. I want to live the truth. Help us, Lord, we pray. And Emmerich Greed said, amen. amen. That was a weak amen. I'm sorry. I'm going to get frustrated here. I tell you, last week I was sitting there and people were just like, amen. They're like, I almost got cranky. I don't want to get cranky. Don't make me angry. Okay, I'm just, kidding, just teasing. All right, then we go, really? Okay, let's do it. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, verse 2, go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, thus say, says the Lord, I remember you. So here's God saying, I remember you. Hear that. The kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, or the love you had during the honeymoon period. When you went after me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Verse 3, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devoured him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. Basically what it's saying, the New Living says real good. Basically anyone who came against you, I came against them. That's how close they were. That's the relationship. How many would like that? How many would like it to where we live so close to God? When someone messes with us, it's like messing with God, and God will take care of it. That's what he's saying. God is doing something quite wonderful here. He's asking Israel, and I believe he's asking us, to remember the honeymoon period. Remember when you first got saved, and you just loved God with all your heart. Do you remember that? How many remember that? I remember that. Just, whoo, everything was God. You know, God this, God that. I, I remember, I was thinking... I remember when I first got saved, you know how now we try to hide it, you know, our Bibles, we try to have the smallest Bible possible. I remember buying a big Ryrie study. Does anyone, any Baptists out there? The Ryrie study Bible was like this big, probably this thick. And then I bought a big obnoxious case that zipped up, had a big sword on it. Remember that? Does anyone remember that? Had the big sword on it. And I had, it was vinyl. And I mean, it was just like... Craig's coming with his Bible. I mean, I mean, you talk about a holy roller. I was one, and I didn't care. Do you remember those days? I didn't care. I wanted people to say, what's that? It's my Bible. Can I tell you about God? You know, no, I'm going to tell you anyway. You know, remember that? I mean, it's just like, I mean, those days when we just loved him. The relationship, he says, he says, remember the honeymoon. Remember our love relationship that we used to have. We were so close. When he called them out of the land of Egypt and how they followed the pillar of fire by, by night and the cloud that covered them from the heat by day. Out in a desolate, terrible wilderness of Egypt, they sought the Lord. They sought God, and he now reminds them of that, of after they had blessed them. He's saying, now, now that I've blessed you, now that you've had a love relation with me, now I've given them, I've given you this great land, the land of Cana, the promised land, and now, sadly, you've turned from me. You've turned from me. Do you see a parallel there? Look at how God has blessed America. Everything was God this. Everything, isn't it amazing? I say this, and I'm going to say this again because you just have to hear how silly we are. Our Congress that voted to take prayer to schools, our Congress that voted to take the Ten Commandments off court buildings and off public buildings is the same Congress that starts every day with prayer. Hello? Is that a little dumb? We can, Congress can pray, but the schools can't pray. I think if adults need God, kids really need God. When, when did you get in the most trouble in your life usually? Teenage years. School years. Yet we're saying Congress needs to be directed and guided by God, and Congress and Senate, but not the schools. 
And you've heard the stats, I think, of what happened when prayer got out of schools. I mean, things went crazy. It went from gum chewing, skipping class, to now rape and murder and people coming and shooting. How I many know that was unheard of back then? That was rare, but now it's normal. It's normal to be shot at schools. It's normal to be, to be you know, metal detectors. It's normal to be very afraid. We've, be, we've forgotten God. But he says, you, you've turned from me. I've given this good land, you've turned from me. Here's what Hosea the prophet says. He says the northern, this to the northern kingdom. He said, Ephraim wax fat and wicked in their comfortable and sophisticated society. They turned away from the living God to serve idols. Do you hear that? Do you know why we sought God? Do you know why we sought God at the beginning here so much? Because we were basically kicked out of England. Do you know that? The Puritans who really wanted to live for God were kicked out of England and were told you can't worship this way. So they said, you know what? We're going to find a country that we can worship the way we believe the Bible says. Look up online the original Mayflower Compact. The one you read in history books is basically, oh, we wanted to start a new land and that's great. No, you read the original, it says we wanted to start a Christian nation. A nation basically under God. How many know that? They knew clearly what they wanted. And isn't it amazing that historians have, have revisionists have had to take that out and revise it? Isn't it amazing? Why? Because we are trying to forget God. And I think that's even worse, isn't it? It's worse that it would be better like Iran that didn't really know the one true God, but we've known the one true God, and now we're trying almost to forget him or write him out of history. How offensive could that be? Could you imagine if your husband came home to you one day and said, you're not my wife? What are you talking about? I don't know who you are. Get out of here. You would be like, what are you talking about? I'm your wife. I've been your wife for 15 years. I don't know you anymore. And that's what they've done. And he's saying that, that you've done this. You, you've done this. He says that one can't help, hear this, one can't help the, the similarity between Judah and our nation. God, as I said earlier, is left out of the business of our country today. Is he not? Think about it. Think about this. Uh, John can attest to this. We built, the, the Supreme Court building was built, I think, in 1930, 1929? 1930. And on our Supreme Court, there are three pictures. I've told you, on the, when, you when the, Supreme, the head Supreme Court judge, the, the chief justice, looks out on his chair, he looks straight at the doors, and straight on the doors is on both sides, carved in wood, the Ten Commandments. And I even asked the tour guide, remember this, John, wasn't it when you and I, I said, hey, what are those things? He goes, you probably think they're the Ten Commandments. He goes, they're just two tablets with five Roman numerals on both sides. That's all they are. I'm like, the way he talked about it was like it was King Tut's tomb. And we didn't know what that was. Like, there's no historians there. This dude just started carving. We didn't know what it was. How many know we know what that was? It's the Ten Commandments. Then the Supreme Court judge, all he has to do is look right up here and he'll see Moses holding the Ten Commandments, looking at them. And then, if you don't have that, on the back of the building, you have at the crest of the building, you have Moses again holding the Ten Commandments like this. But we're not a Christian nation. We didn't found it in Christ. Then you go to the Senate. I, I, I might have this mixed up, but I think in the, in the Congress, you look and write the, you have a bust of Moses. And in, in the Senate, you have right underneath the Senate, in God we trust. And then I think the Senate, the, 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 whatever the House Speaker, looks at a picture, a bust of Moses. So you have a constant reminder of the Ten Commandments. You have a constant reminder of our Judeo-Christian faith. And yet we're trying hard. We're, we're almost like, hear this, can I just say, we're trying hard to offend God. It's like we're trying hard. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i waiting for the day when they'll have enough nerve to try to remove those things. Do you know how much sandblasting will have to take place in Washington if they do that? I mean, do you know what? I mean, right on the top of the Washington Monument is, is Gloria, whatever in Latin, it means gl the glory of God. That's the first thing. When the sun hits it, it sees, it's saying the sun hits Glory, glory be to God. And yet we say we're not a Christian nation. Yet we've forgotten our God. And, and so God is left out of the business of our country. Our nation that was founded by men and women who believed the Bible. 
I mean, do you realize that everyone was sworn on the Bible? Only recently was a, was a Muslim sworn on the Quran. Everyone was sworn on the Bible. And you remember what Ken Ham said? He says in the days, it, you didn't have to say, when you said, you know, you need to believe in God, they didn't go, which God, like now? It was, of course, the God of the Bible. Isn't that amazing how far we fall? We think that's progression. That's falling away. You know? And, and so our nation that was found on the Bible, the Word of God, everything they did was based on the book of the Word of, the word of God. One of, our, one of our historians has observed our nation and now is, 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 he says our nation is now controlled by men and women who do not know its, excuse me, spiritual heritage. They don't know its spiritual heritage. Hear this. I was in a tour with David Barton, I think. Were you with us? And I was, for one time, usually with John, I'm always wrong and John always sets me straight. But this one time, I was right. And George Muhlenberg, this statue, right when you walk in the rotunda, we'd always come in, what? What is it? Peter, there he sees, right? See? Okay. I had the last name right. But I said to him, I go, where's the statue? Because I said, I was right about that. Tell him that. One time. I got to So I walk in, and I said, where's the statue? And, and John goes, I don't think it was there. I go, no, it was a statue. It was right there. And there's a statue of George Muhlenberg, a pastor who was wearing, they called him a black regiment because they wore black robes. And what he does is when he preached, he tore off his robe, and he had the Continental Army uniform on. And he says, we need to fight for our freedom to worship God. So he has him pulling off his robe and, and basically getting ready to grab his sword. And that was right in the rotunda. So I asked David Barton, I said, where's... where's Peter, Mule, whatever, Muhlenberg dude. Where's the guy pulling off his robe? Where's that guy? And he goes, well, when our president came in, the man of God went downstairs. He's now in the crypt. We're, we're in the basement where, where, where um, uh, George Washington was to be buried. He's in the basement. Now I'm thinking, I'm hoping that's not true. I'm hoping it's just the moving around of statues to make things fair. But that is pretty sad if that's true. But at least David Barton, as you many have know, joked that uh, when the when yeah. anyway, that's enough said. I think you know what I'm trying to say. We've turned away from God, and we're going after the idols of the Almighty Dollar. And, and think about that. Think about us as Orvalians. What do we really want? We want money, and why do we want money? We want money so we want to have security. And there's nothing wrong with that, but hear this. But what do we really, really want money for? Really what we want money for is for what? Pleasure. Is it not? Pleasure. I want to be able to go on the vacation I want. I want to be able to retire when I want. I want to be able to do whatever I want. I want to be able to buy whatever I want. I want to be secure. And hear this. What is the sin of the last days? What did Paul tell Timothy? He says, in the last days, men will be lovers of what? Pleasure rather than lovers of God. And we love the almighty dollar because we love the pleasure that it brings us. And hear this, money is not evil. The love of money is evil. The love, what is our, why do we want money? Do we want it just for our own selfish pleasures or do we want it to bless the church, to bless others, to help others, to have our needs met, but to also bless others? You know, God wants you to be blessed. But it's not like what TBN pastors tell you. They say, they appeal to your flesh. God wants you to be blessed so you can spend it all on yourself. God wants you and I to be blessed that we can what? Be a blessing. He wants you to be the head and not the tail. He wants you to be able to loan and not borrow. Wouldn't that be cool? But guess what? A lot of times we take the resource. Think of this. I've told you this. People gave more in the depression the, the percentage of giving to the church was higher in the depression than it is today, than it is in the last 10 years, even when things were good back in 07 and before. Isn't that sad? That shows how selfish we've become. How we're, I've had people tell me in this church, I just had someone a couple months ago tell me, Craig, I can't tithe. And I go, why, why can't you tithe? Well, I can't tithe because I've bought two houses, and now my payments are too big. I can't afford to tithe. What do you think God's answer would be to that? So you're robbing me with two houses, 
and you can't afford to give to me, so basically you shouldn't have that second house. But God would deny me of my pleasure? My security of two homes? God forbid I rebuke you, Craig, in the name of Jesus. Right? Isn't that why most people don't give? I can't afford to because I'm living for my pleasures. The Ephesians chanted, Great is Diana of Ephesus, but the cry of America is, Great is the almighty dollar. And hear this, though. Hear this. If this doesn't make you pray, I don't know what will, but do you realize that China does not like the dollar? That China is now trying to talk about getting rid of the dollar as being the world currency for trade? Can you imagine what would happen? I don't know much about finance, but I'm told that if they get rid of us as the world currency, we won't be able to print as much money as we have, and we will have inflation through the roof. Our dollar will just crash. Do, do, Do you hear what I'm trying to say? God could get our attention real quick if we don't get the message right now of let's seek him while he may be what? Found. Let's seek him when it's good. How many know? I don't want to have to go through depression to realize my need for God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. I don't want to. And, and tell me someone here that would disagree with me that if we do not continue, if we don't stop continuing the way we're going, that we won't head towards that. Someone lied to me and tell me, no, I think we're doing fine. We have deficit spending. I, I mean, our president tells us that everything's great. Right, the jobs are going up, but yet we have more people on uh, we have more people on on, social, uh, on uh, welfare than ever before. How does that work? We have more jobs and more people on welfare. That doesn't make sense to me. Amen. Amen. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Sadly, God has been left out of our country. But He says this. Here's what God says. Here's the positive. I want to be positive, encouraging, Caleb. I don't want to just be bad news. I gotta. I don't want you to hate me like Jeremiah. I remember you. God says, I remember. Even though you've forgotten me, I still remember you. But you, you sadly have forgotten me. Isn't it amazing how gracious God is? Could you imagine if you were God? Can you imagine if someone forgot you, a country? You'd say, Fine. All right. You 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 don't want to. Okay. You want to diss me? Could you imagine what you would do if you were God to people like us? You would be like, but God says what? He says, you can hear him. He says, I remember you. I I miss you. And yet you don't seem to miss me. You know, they say there's the opposite of love is not hate. Hate is not good. I'm not saying it is. But the opposite of love is what? Apathy. I don't care. And then think about us. I, I, can I just say this? Can I just be nice? Because I'm already probably torquing some of you off. But just look at yourself worshiping. I, I want to get a camera. I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to put a camera like there and show and just kind of have it where it pans and show some of you guys worshiping. I mean, seriously. You know how everyone does the wave when they see the camera? I mean, some of you worship. If you saw yourself, you'd be like, I don't love God. Now you'll go, no, worship is a private thing. Come on. Seriously? Do you go up to your wife when you ask her to marry you? Hey, what's up, dude? Um, hey, you want to get married? You got on your knees. You did. <sighs> you're right? If we love God, well, if you're happy and you know it, your face will surely show it. Amen? You, you shouldn't be going, Lord, I love you so much. You're so awesome, God. I mean, there should be some enthusiasm. You know what enthusiasm means? In theo, filled with God. There should be enth- I don't care if you're tired. I, I got two and a half hours sleep last night. And I'm enthused because God is good. Amen? It's not based on my sleep. It's based on God. And we should be able to come here and say, hey, I'm tired. I've got a lot of stress. I've got problems. i got work is crazy. But you know what? God is good. And we need to say that. And we need to do it. Amen. You can clap. Amen. God is good. And I want to say how gracious God is. That he doesn't say, fine, you don't like me, I don't like you. He says, I remember you. I miss you. Why don't you miss me? And I pray that you and I are starting to miss God. We're starting to miss God. Listen to his longing. He says, Israel was holiness to me. I remember how eager you were to please me. As a young bride long ago, how you loved me and followed me, even though you were in a barren wilderness. 
Even in hard times, you belong to me, you followed me, and we were in love. You were also led by me. You followed, you did what I asked. Do you remember what Jesus said? Think about this. Think if you base your love for Jesus by what he said. He says what? If you love me, you will what? Obey my commandments. So look at how many commandments we don't obey. And let that be a template. Let that be what it shows us where we are spiritually. A Chinese Christian that knows nothing does what little he knows because he loves God with all of his heart. Amen? Verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob. Hitting for us. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Verse 5. Thus says the Lord. Hear this. What, here's the humbling of God. What is the injustice your fathers have found in me? That they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. What injustice? What sin have I done? Can you imagine God asking that? What have I done? I almost feel sorry for God right now. I'm almost sad and like, God, don't stoop this low. I'm thinking of that song, You've Lost That Loving Feeling. It says, I get down on my knees for you. God right here is getting on his knees for us. And he's saying, I love you. Why don't you love me? And if you've ever had someone not love you that you love, you know that pain. And God is saying, why? After all I've done for you, why are you forsaking? Why are you turning to these other gods? Why? Without doubt, this is one of the greatest passages and saddest passages in all Scripture. Notice the wonderful way in which God approaches them. What did I do wrong that you have turned from me, have forsaken me? In our day, God would humbly ask us, have I done something to offend you? What have I done to offend you? What's so wrong with me that you're not more interested in me? Why are you not seeking me with all your heart? And think about it. Think about it. When I ask that question, when God asks that question to me, all I can say is, hear this, I love my pleasures more than you. Amen? It's not that I don't love God. It's that I just have another love or other loves that compete. I have more than one husband. I have videos. I have movies. I have entertainment. I have just wanting to sleep. And yet God says, when you love, hear this, I'm just going to say this to you. People say, I don't have time to seek God. No, no. Then, then don't tell me about doing any hobbies. Because what do we say? You make time for what is important for you. Don't say you don't have time. If you watch TV, don't say you don't have time to seek God because I told you what God said to me. I said, God, I don't have enough time. So I can get about an hour, two hours every night. How I many know if we sought God for two, an hour, two hours every night, how I many know we'd be different people? Different people. Now hear this. You might say, man, Craig, this is hard. This is legal. I'm saying this because this is what God is saying. Do you hear what he said? Hear the word of the Lord. This isn't the word of Craig. This is the word of God saying, America, come back to me so that what? I don't have to bring judgment. Come back so I can bless you. Come back to me so that we can have this love relationship. So you obey me. You live again by my precepts so that I can then be what? Free to bless America. Don't we want that? Don't, can, can anyone say with me that you kind of feel the hand of God kind of withdrawing from America a little bit? Don't you feel it? Don't you feel when he says, when the prophets say the heavens are like brass, don't you feel? It's not the way it used to be when, when I came to know the Lord in the 80s and back in the revival and the Jesus movement. It's not the same. Everywhere you turned was God. Now it's like it's hard. You, you can worship and feel like you're just kind of singing to the ceiling. And I want that to change, amen? amen? I want it to change. And we're going to see in a second that what we should say to see that. Verse 6. Neither did they say, where, hear this, this is what we need to say to ourselves. Neither did they say, where is the Lord? Do you know we need to say that? How many of us come to church and we just go, that was a drag. That was not so great. Craig was chubby. Doesn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Lived at that church and worship stunk. It was too hot. It was too cold. Blah, blah. But none of us really go. How many of us leave this place and going, where is the Lord? Where is the Lord? Where's the move of God? Do you understand? I'm not saying God is here, but where is the move? Where is that where we go? God was here today. Oh my goodness. 
we're kind of happy. Well, I guess God's just not really into us, so I guess he doesn't like subterranean churches, so I don't know. But I'm saying I don't see him rocking too many other churches either. So, you know what I mean? Where is the Lord? Where is the Lord? The priests were supposed to, as the pastor should be asking, where is the Lord? What, what have we done to offend him? Who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? Who led us through the wilderness, through the land of deserts and pits, through the land of drought and shadow of death? through the land that, that no one crossed, where no one dwelt. Verse 7, I, God saying, brought you into the bountiful country to eat its fruits and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. How many know we've done that? We're now forgetting God, making it abomination, slapping God in the face. Verse 8, the priest did not say, where is the Lord? Hear that. The priests or the pastors of our day are not saying, where is the Lord? What's going on? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things or idols that do not profit. God puts the responsibility on the spiritual leaders, the pastors. And I believe that that's the problem in our country today. It began in the church. Amen? And I want to say, you know, I'm going to say this, and I might get emotional here, but I say, you know what? Tough. If you get mad at me for putting down other pastors, if you get mad at me for putting down other churches, because I want to tell you, I put them down not because I'm jealous of them, not because I want to be like them, but because I believe when you preach half the gospel, when you preach that you're a great person and God wants to make you a better person and you can have your best day now and you can have every day like Friday and you can find the champion in you, that is not the gospel of the Bible. Amen? Amen. And I will not be ashamed to say you pastors have ruined this country and are ruining this country because you have made a self-centered gospel instead of a Christ-centered gospel. And I will not apologize for that. Amen? And we need to stand up and say enough, no more. I don't want TBN Christianity. I don't want a self-centered Christianity. I don't want it to be all about me. I want it to be about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And I demand that my pastors, I demand that the leaders, that you hear a guy on KGMS or some Christian radio, that you call up and say, this is wrong. And so that's why I mention these people. That's why I mentioned the pastor that wave and said, this is my Bible. I believe what it says, I believe, it says, but I'm not going to teach from it. There's something very wrong with that. You know, it sounds good, it looks good, but it's not good because he doesn't teach from it. He doesn't teach the whole council. How many know this? Here's what the message is to America. If Jesus came, the message would be, you guys are sinning. You guys have turned away from me. Turn back to me that you might be healed. That would be the message. Not, you're great, keep it up. Don't change a thing. How many know that's what the prophets were saying countering Jeremiah's message? And how many know there's many pastors today countering my message? That's why this church is so small. Because people go, wait a second. I have people say, wait a second. Why does the church down the road say a totally different gospel than you? Because the new gospel of this age is a man-centered gospel. That's why. So God puts the responsibility on the pastor. And that's why... To be honest with you, I'm kind of ashamed of a lot of pastors. I'm not saying I'm perfect, don't get me wrong, but I'm ashamed that they're not even trying. They've just sort of said, you know, and I'll tell you this, just so you know that I'm aware of it, a part of me goes, you know, just last week I was really discouraged, and I just said, you know what, Lord, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm preaching the wrong message. The new numbers are kind of saying that, so maybe I should just, maybe, maybe I'm being too hard. And the Lord just like didn't even respond. How I many you know that's a good when the Lord doesn't even respond, you know you're being stupid. And the Lord said, Jeremiah didn't have one convert, okay? You at least have a hundred people. So quit your whining, wuss. That's the message Bible. You know what I mean? I mean it's like and I just went, Wow, okay. So, yeah, we're living the last days, and in the last days, men will want their ears tickled. Okay, oh, man, I'm, I'm such a tickler, w wuss myself, that I wanted to believe that everyone's going to embrace the message of the whole counsel of God. But I thank God for you guys. I do thank God for you guys. I thank God that you do want God on his terms. Amen? Yeah. Notice, no nation falls until it first falls spiritually. 
especially a Christian nation. There is first, I think I've told you this, that I think it was a secular guy who investigated why Russia, you know, I think it was, what is it, 19, was it 19, oh, 18? When did it, 1918 when they became communists? They used to be the biggest exporter of wheat, one of the biggest exporters. Within two years of becoming communists, they became the biggest importer of wheat. That's what communism, socialism does. Okay? And you know what the guy who, and he wasn't a Christian, he looked at it, and he looked at everything, and studied the history of Russia, and you know what he basically said? He goes, their problem was they forgot God. Isn't that amazing that a secular guy could see, oh my goodness, they forgot God. They forgot godly principles. They forgot God. How I many of that's where we're heading if we don't have an awakening or revival? And I pray that this message does not annoy you, but it awakens you. That's what I mean. That's why I don't like to use the word revival because we think, ooh, ooh, you know, it's like, ooh, I had a revival. Woo. No, revival is we need an awakening where. Okay, like an awakening of losing weight. Uh, you know, what happens when someone gets a heart attack? I have an awakening. I am fat. I got to stop it. That's an awakening. We need an awakening to say enough, right? And here's what happens. You guys go, amen, and then you go right back to living the same way. That's not an awakening. Awakening is when you say, you know what? What Craig was saying was God, and so God said it. Craig, I wanted to blame Craig and be hateful and annoyed at Craig, but it's really you, isn't it? So if I love you, I need to do this. I have an awakening. I'm going to obey. That's an awakening. First comes spiritual apostasy. Because why? The leaders have chosen. You know what? That word apostasy means a willful departure for the truth. You know, I know a lot of you have been taught once saved, always saved. You can never, once you've prayed a prayer, you're, you're in like Flynn. You can do anything you want. You can be homosexual. You can do anything, and you're saved. That's not biblical. That's not true. That is not true. I'd love to believe that, but the Bible simply, if you read your whole Bible, does not teach that. The Bible teaches what? If you continually abide, then you're secure in your salvation. You say you prayed a prayer when you're 12 and now you live for the devil, you need to be concerned. Did I really pray a prayer of faith? Amen? Amen. So the apostasy there means a willful departure from the truth. It means like insurrection, like mutiny on a ship. It means to... to by choice, disrespect your commanding officer. So the pastor sort of said, God, what, what have the pastor of our day said? You know what, God, your gospel is rough. All your disciples were killed, most of them except John. John they even tried to kill, but he didn't die. And then Paul was killed, and all of them were killed. So God, I can help you out. I'm going to change your gospel and fix it so that we don't have to be killed. So I can have presidential candidates come to my church so I'll be the man. And what did God say? Woe to you when all men think you're the man. Woe to you when all men speak well of you like they did what? The false prophets. Woe to you when everyone thinks you're the bomb, when your church is the biggest and just can't stop growing and it's almost like a small city. So it comes a spiritual apostasy, a willful falling away. And then comes what? Moral failure. Are we not seeing moral failure in our country? I went to U of A in 86 and I was studying psychology and I remember they even had it in one of the books that homosexuality was a a psychosis, was a problem, was a mental problem. And now they think it's now it's something to be celebrated. It's not a problem. It's a great thing. It's awesome. You're gay. I've had people, Christians, when someone comes out and says they're gay as a Christian, other Christians saying, oh, I'm so happy for you. Do you realize what they're saying to them? Do you know what they're saying to them? They're unrepentant. They're saying, I'm so happy that you're going to hell. That is awesome. Because the Bible says homosexuals, adulterers, fornicators, drunkards shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. But now we're celebrating people going into it as a Christian. We have moral failure. And we need to say enough. And we need to be able to say to someone, no. You cannot be a Christian homosexual. You can be someone who was a homosexual, and now in Christ, you struggle with it, but you need to give it up. Just like you need to give up adultery. Just like you need to give up fornication. You need to do that. And if you're going to say, no, I'm a Christian fornicator or a Christian adulterer, you need to think again because Paul says, no, you can't be a Christian and continue willfully in those things. So why? Why is there a moral failure? Because, hear this, our country no longer knows the truth of the Word of God. We don't know what is right. 
We don't know, you know, we don't know, you know, Oprah will say, right? She, the one lady said, she said that, you know, there's, there's got to be many gods, or there's got to be one God, but many ways to him. There's got to be many ways. And the one lady had the nerve to stand up and says, no, no, no. The Bible says in John 14, 6, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. And she goes, what? What? Are you going to say that God is? Jesus is the only way to the Father. And she says, no, that's what the Bible says. I'm just quoting it. Well, that's ridiculous because, you know, Oprah knows. Yeah, it's on YouTube if you want to see it. And it's like, I mean, you know, so we think, like, here's what my aunt thinks, my new age aunt. She thinks that there's many ways to God, Buddha, Confucianism, Hinduism, and our way. Because we're Americans, just happens to be Jesus. That's why my aunts accepted Jesus four times in our church. And I said, so is Jesus the only way to the Father? No, but he's my way. I mean, that doesn't cut it. That sounds nice, but it's not biblical because Jesus needs us to say, no, I'm the only way to the Father. I'm the only life. I'm the only truth. And how many know when you say that, you become really uncool? Just say that in front of a school. Go to a liberal, go to college, go to the U of A. Say, I just want to say something real quick. All of your other religions, if you don't know Jesus, you're wrong. <sighs> I mean, you'll, and you, you'll see people that are even nice, <sighs> vampires everywhere, zombies. <sighs> yeah, I mean, it'll be crazy. So we don't know the truth of the Bible. And then finally, we have, hear this, political anarchy. We don't have that today, do we? Think about this. This is what I love. When you know the Bible, what do you know? Paul said what? Do as I say, not as I do. Didn't he say that? How many good Catholics remember hearing that as if it was scripture? Do as I say, not as I do. Just, hey, you, I, I'm drinking. Just, you don't do it. Right? But what does God say? What did God say through Paul? He says, follow me as I follow the example of Christ. But yet here we have, and I'm going to say this, and you can get mad, but just write the email to Kevin. He reads them anyway. But here it is. We have Harry Reid saying, pushing Obamacare, pushing it so hard. Every, you, you peasants need this so bad, but I'm going to exempt my staff from it. Wait a sec. Wait a sec. If it's so good for me, why isn't it good for you and the rest of Congress and the Senate? Ding, ding, ding. That should be a big telltale sign right there. Right? If I sell you, think of it if I'm hair club for men. Right? And I say, do you, do you use it? No way. I would never use that stuff. Well, then why are you selling it to me? Because you, you need it. You're ugly. <laughs> Could you imagine? But yes, and then what they're saying, well, you know, we have a better thing, but you need it, you know? That's anarchy. That's, that's like dictatorship. And we've allowed that. Remember, it used to be government for the people, by the people. It used to be what the people, the majority ruled, not, <coughs> excuse me, a few liberals. And now we see we're becoming almost a dictatorship because why? Because people hear this. I love what George Washington said. You know what, George Washington? Hear this. Our unchristian, one of our unchristian forefathers said, you cannot rule this great country without God and the Bible. And here's another statement he said that was awesome. He said, you cannot truly govern well unless you yourself are governed. Think about it. If you're Harry Reid and you say, hey, you know, you peasants, let me tell you what you need. You realize, wait a second, someday I'm going to stand before God and have to give an account for how I treated the people he entrusted to me. Amen? Amen. When you know you're going to stand before God and give an account for all that you did, then you will what? Think very carefully of what how you treat others. You will... Remember the golden rule of do unto others as you you remember. Don't exploit your workers. Don't oppress people. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And yet we see our government has quickly forgotten that. Amen? We're all struggling financially, but they get raises every, every two years, right? Isn't that amazing? We're in a deficit, but hey, give ourselves a raise. I don't get to do that. I haven't a raise in eight years. Because why? Because we're, we're, we're in a deficit. That's the way every nation makes its exit from being a great nation. Because the priests or pastors don't say, and the people of God, you, don't say, where is the Lord? Think about that. Think about that question. Wouldn't that be a great question for you to ask from this day forward? That when you sense a leanness of his presence in your family, 
in your marriage, in your church, that you wouldn't say, man, I need to find a new church. You'd say, where is the Lord? Lord, is there anything I'm doing that is grieving you? Is there anything I'm doing or not doing that's quenching you? Is there anything that you would want to change in me? And what do you bet? That's a, a prayer God will answer. Is there anything I need to stop doing or start doing? There are far too many people today who are supposed to be Bible teachers, pastors and witnesses for him who don't know the word of God. And I'm sorry to say that, but it happens to be true. And as a result of not knowing the word of God, they don't really know the God of the word. Amen? To know the God of the word, you know you need to know the word of God. Amen? Now some people say, do you know what people say? I'm not a Christian, I'm spiritual. Spiritual. And usually if you ask me, do you read your Bible? No, I'm spiritual. I find God in golfing, go-kart racing, <laughs> Catalina. That's neat, but you're going to be basically a pine tree. I mean, what are you going to have? You know what I mean? Well, what is your doctrine going to be? You know, what is it going to be? I love pine needles. Sands gritty in your shoes. I mean, what is going to be? What are you going to be able to say? You're not going to know anything. We need to know the Word of God to know the God of the Word, to know the one true God. Yeah. Know God, to know God is necessary to know as this is the Word of God. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Verse 9, and hear this. The New King James is kind of funny. It's pretty scary. Most of your versions here are pretty scary. It says, therefore, I will yet bring charges against you uh, and your children's children. Now, hear this. I think it's amazing because usually... The newer versions are nicer than the King, old King James, but here, the old King James is a lot nicer than the newer version. So I'm going to go with the old King Jimmy because I believe that God is wooing us. He's going to bring judgment, but he's right now saying, you know, he's saying, what have I done wrong? I remember you. Come on. What, what iniquity have you found in me? And I, so I'm, I believe that this is probably more accurate in my opinion. I look at, just so you know, people get mad at me and say, well, what version do you use? I use the New King James, what I teach out of it. If you notice, I'll a lot of times use whatever version is the best for the text. I look at the New King James, the New Living, the NIV, and the New American Standard. I look at those four. I have a comparison thing on my program. So I look at them and see which one I believe best accurately describes the text. And some people have a problem with that, but how many know it's been interpreted by men? The original is perfect, but in the interpretation, some of that is a little weak because you'll see every interpretation has strengths and weaknesses. If you really want to be technical, the most accurate version of the Bible we have is the New American Standard, yet it's a very hard read because it's so literal and it's kind of, eh, 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 and it's really hard for someone like me to read. That's why I love to, in my devotion time, to read the New Living, even though it's a transliteration. But anyway, enough of that. But here's what he says in the, in the old King Jimmy. He says, wherefore, I will yet plead with you. How many like that better? I like that a little better, right? I'm still, he's still pleased, not saying enough. He's still pleading with you. He says, there, wherefore, I, or therefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and your children's children I will plead. How many love that? Love Pleading, saying, come on. And I believe, and even if this offends you, God is wooing you, saying, come back. I'm pleading with you, don't. Make, you know, it's kind of like, it's like, you know, parents say, is, this spanking is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. That's what God's sort of saying and meaning it. I don't want to bring a spanking to America, so please, please do what's right. Please come back to me. God says, I have not given up on you, America, and on Israel. I'm still going to plead with you to return to me. And all I can say is, how wonderful, how incredible, incredibly merciful is God to us. The Bible says in Psalms, his love and, excuse me, endures forever, and it truly does, amen? But hear this. I want to balance that out because we definitely know that, right? We all know, yeah, his love endures forever. That's why we're not worried, Craig. That's why it's all cool. We can do whatever we want. Hear this. This is a verse that you need to hear because the whole council is Genesis 6-3. Write that down if you're a note taker. I don't know if any of you know it. I don't see any note takers, but write it down. But hear this. He says, God will not always strive with us. There comes a time where God says, I've not. you ever heard your mom or your grandma say, I've had it! Yes. <laughs> had it! Enough! I'm echoing, that's cool. That great effects. I mean, you know, <laughs> Sunday, Sunday. No, okay. But, you know, I've had it! I've had it! 
And that's what God's saying. I've had it. It's done. I'm, 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 I'm done. And there comes a point where God will say, I've had it, America. And we need to, that, there needs to be a holy fear of that a little bit. We, we need to not just see him as, you know, Mr., you know, the old grandpa. Oh, there you got candy. Oh, here, you know, I love my grandkids. He is awake. He's alert, and he knows what we're doing. Amen. He is the ultimate Santa Claus. Amen. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Can you remember? Hear this. Sorry, that really just killed the anointed in it. But anyway. Can you remember a time when you love God more than you do now? Think about that question. Can you remember a time where you love God more than you do now? And I don't mean just in your heart where you say, oh yeah, I love him, but really where you showed you loved him, where you spent more time with him. I think most of us who are honest can say yes. Was there a time when you, your love for him was real and fresh and vibrant? When it wasn't a drudgery, it was real, it was so exciting. Have things changed? Have your devotions become basically non-existent or when you do do it, it's just a drag? How many like me have just done your one-year Bible just to do it, but you didn't touch God and God didn't touch you and it was just like you thought, this is a waste of time. But you don't say it out loud because Christians don't say those kind of things. Is going to church a drag, a drudgery? Is hearing your pastor go for an hour? Do you realize in the 1800s, an hour was normal? An hour and a half, hour to an hour and a half was normal preaching. Now the normal preaching is 20 minutes. You get three sermons for the price of one. My wife says, she goes, honey, that's why people don't come, because they got three sermons. You can't. No. So anyway. Are doing the things of God a burden to you? Is serving at the church a burden to you? Think about it. We have to beg for Sunday school teachers all the time, nursery workers. We have to beg for money. I know we're st- I'm stopping to beg for money and say, thank God. But that doesn't mean we don't want money. That, means, that doesn't mean that God doesn't see what you're giving, that you're not going to be accountable for what you've given or not given. God would say to you and I today, remember. Remember how it was when you really loved me and you truly sought me with all your heart. They may have been, you may have gone through tough times, but you had me and I had you and we were together and it was great because you were fully committed to me. So I believe God would say to us today, son, daughter, come back to me. Come back to me wholeheartedly today and I will receive you. I believe that's what the Bible means when it says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Because hear this. And this isn't scare text, this is the truth. You don't know if you will be like Paul Walker today. You don't know if you go out of here and all of a sudden, boom, it's a car crash and it's over. And you need to be right with God today. Not put it off. If some of you are thinking, well, I'll just do it. No, I'm young. I'm going to live for self and I'll put it off till next year or the year after. How many know you and I are not guaranteed a year after? So if you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you today to remember God, to come back to your first love, then you need to do it. Come back to Him. And I want to end with this. It's Revelation 2.4. It's Jesus, and He's critiquing the seven churches. And He's saying to the church of Ephesus, He's saying, I know your works. You, You work hard for me. You don't tolerate evil. You don't tolerate false Christians or Jews. But I have this against you, he says. And most of you know what it is, what? You've lost or you've forsaken your first love. It's like God is saying, you've lost that love and feeling. You're really saying that. I mean, I was listening today to that song and listening as if God was singing it to me. And I want to tell you, I started crying. And it wasn't because of Tom Cruise. It was because I realized, oh my goodness, this is song is God. He's singing this in this text to us today. So if you're here today and you say, that's me. My heart is hard. I'm cold towards God. Then God would say, what's the answer? Life's hard. It's over. No, I'm kidding. He wouldn't say that. 
He would say what? Verse, middle of verse 5, he'd say this. Turn back to me. Do the works you did at first. Do you hear that? Do the works you did at first. Remember your former works. Do you remember what you did when you first got saved? Do you remember what you did? You, you carried your Bible. You read your Bible, not just once a week. You read it almost every day and a couple times a day. Do you remember what you also did? You also cut out a lot of secular music and just kind of worship God. At least I did. I remember when I got saved in 1981, there wasn't things called boombox or Walkmans. There, I had like the original little cassette walk thing. It cost me like 300 bucks. This was when I was a drug dealer. And I had it, and it was like this big, and it, and it just was huge. It cost $300. That was really weird. I, that was like, no one had those. But it, what I remember is I used to worship in my car to where almost my battery would die because I'd just sit in my car worshiping God. I was a Baptist, so we didn't know how to worship, so I would worship alone, closet in my car because I was afraid anyone would think I was a charismatic. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about, if you're Baptist, right? I was a Baptist. And... And so, you know, I, I just remember that. I remember I, remember I couldn't, I, nobody, I couldn't be around anyone without telling them about Jesus. You remember that? Even if, they, even if they didn't like me, I was like, hey, I love Jesus more. If you don't like me, if you don't like Jesus, then you don't like me and I don't like you. I didn't say that. But, you know, I mean, I was like, I don't care. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Now we're like, well, now I'm more mature. I've got to make Jesus more palatable. Mm-hmm. But hear this, and I'm going along, I'm sorry, but. It's just what I do. But here it is. I love what Pastor Chuck, the late, great Pastor Chuck, he said this about this verse. He says, some of you go, but Craig, I don't feel it. You know, we're all about feelings, aren't we? Well, if I don't feel it, I don't want to be a hypocrite. If I don't feel it, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, I don't, I'm not into God. I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm not into God or I'm not going to worship. I'm not into it. I'm just keeping it real. But think about this. I'll give you two examples. About Chuck said, first comes the motions, and then comes the emotions. Mm-hmm. Remember your former works. Remember what you did. Think about this. Remember, hopefully none of you saw the movie, but if you did, you know, you can repent later. But is I was told that the movie Mr. and Mrs. Smith with, with uh, Brad Pitt and what's her name? Oh, you know, Angelina Jolie, that... They pretend to be husband and wife in that movie. And then what happened after that movie? They actually hooked up. Because why? You go through the motions, then comes the emotions. Amen? I never forget hearing, I don't know if it was in Fireproof 2, but I never forget a pastor once saying that he told this couple, this, this, this married couple that had been in his church for 20 years, said, came to him and the husband said, I don't love my wife anymore. I don't love her anymore. I, I've lost that love and feeling. I'm done. And the pastor said, okay, well, just do, will you do one thing for me? He says, yes, just treat her the way you did the, when you were courting her, when you were trying to get her to marry her. Treat her for three weeks like that. Just do that for me. Will you do it? And he goes, oh, that's going to be hard. I don't feel anything towards her. I just don't like her. And he says, just do it. And then he says, if you want to get a divorce, he goes, then I guess, you know, do it. I mean, it's, I don't believe it's biblical, but, you know, you're going to do what you're going to do. And he, so he started doing what he did when he was trying to woo her to marry him. And the man, pastor, asked him three weeks later, How, do you want a divorce? He goes, no, I'm more in love with my wife than I ever have been. Why? Because he did the motions, and then came what? The emotions. Think about us, husbands and wives. What's happened? You don't get the flowers anymore. You don't get the chocolates anymore. And what do we say? Oh, they just know I love, they, I love them. They know. And the spouse, like, the wife's like, no, I don't. I don't know. You think I do, but I don't. Right? I've never seen a wife say, enough with the flowers already, okay? Enough. Oh, some, I had, no, I do know one person that did that. I want a live flower because flowers die. Right? Tree hugger. Anyway, but... Um, <laughs> but today, if that's you, and you would say, Craig, I... I, I how many of you, can, I just, can we just be bold here? How many of you could say your love could be a little stronger for God? Yeah, almost all of you. Right? So I want to pray a prayer for us. That we would start going through the motions of what we, we'd start to remember. I was thinking the other day, I was thinking of getting on my old Hosanna Integrity tapes. Remember those? Oh, yeah. 
whoop. I mean, they were like funky back then, right? They had these weird drum beats, but it was good worship. I mean, the worship was so spirit-filled, but it was like funky beats, and it was kind of weird, you know, it was kind of, when you come from ACDC, anything is sort of weird <laughs> in worship. But it was like so powerful because it was from the heart. And so we need to, you know, I was thinking, I got to get out my old CD. CD. Do you guys know what CDs are? Any of the young people? They're these little discs. They're like eight tracks. Remember that? Isn't that weird? CDs are eight tracks now to our kids, you know, but I don't have any idea what that is. But anyway. So let's pray. Let's ask God to help us do those former works so that we might have that love, that vibrant love relationship with Him again. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you are such a gracious, humble God that you would literally get on your knees and beg for us to come back to you. When you could so easily turn your back on us and say, you know what, you've forsaken me now, I've utterly forsaken you. But thank you, God, that you have not done that. You are gracious. You are merciful and you are true. And I pray that that grace and mercy would not promote us or continue to push us to say, you know what, I'm going to keep on doing what I've done then. But that kindness would convict us right now. That loving kindness would convict us to say, how can I be so cruel to someone that's so loving and true to me? How can I reject somebody who's always been kind to me, always been loving to me, always wanted the best for me? And I pray this right now, Lord. I pray if there's anyone here that feels falsely that they have an indictment against you. Well, God, why did you let me be grow up in the family I did? Or why did you let my first spouse leave me? Or why did you allow this child to die? Or why did you allow this? That we would realize, Lord, that is not you. We live in a sinful world. We live in a fallen world where there is sin, where there is death, where there is pain. And you don't do it. But you do say it happens. It's, it's part of the sinful world. But you promised us, those of us in Christ, that not all things that happen are good, but you promise we keep on with you, all things will work together for good to those who what? Love you and keep your commands. Lord, I pray that you'll help us Whatever we did, we all have different backgrounds. If it was carrying our Bible, I guess now we have it on our phone, then let's read our Bible maybe at lunch. If it was worshiping, if it was turning off talk news radio and just worshiping God on the way to work, then let's worship God. If it was praying throughout the day, if it was getting away and walk, taking a walk with God, then let's get away and talk with God. I know you've awoken that in me, getting out in the wilderness. There's something about getting out of an office and getting out into the woods, especially when it's cooler, to just pray and see your creation and just spend time walking quietly with you. Lord, I ask, oh God, that your Holy Spirit would woo us. We humbly admit we are wayward, unfaithful wives. We have, we, our hearts get distracted. We are attention deficit from you. So Lord, draw us in. Woo us. Let us hear what you've said in this scripture. Let us start to answer back. Yes, where is my love? Where is God? And I pray that as we seek you, as you said in Jeremiah 29, 13, you said, when you seek me, church, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart or wholeheartedly. Lord, let us You've given your whole heart to us. I pray now, today, we would say afresh. Just say that to him. Lord, I give you my heart afresh. I want to let go of those other loves, those other things. And I want to grab hold of you afresh. Lord, I don't want it to be, I don't want you to say to me, you've you've fought the good fight, you've done these things, but you've lost your first love. I want my love for you to be fresh alive and just as fresh today after 32 years. This last week was 32 years of Christianity. I pray that it'll be just as fresh today in 32 years as it was the first month. Bless your people. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Let them honor your word and let them believe that this small group, this remnant right here, if they would take you seriously at your word, they could be used by you to turn this country right side up. 12 men did it. What could... 40 people do. So Lord, bless your people. 
Give them that hope and vision for their lives, what you have for them. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.